Special Operations. Covert Ops. Espionage. The Team House. With your hosts, Jack Murphy Six, five, and David Park. Four, three, two, one. Hi, Jack. Good evening, everyone. This is episode 158 of The Team House. I'm Jack Murphy here with in the other side of our hotel room, uh, David Park, just on the other side. We're joining you live from Las Vegas, Nevada. We're out here at DEF CON this weekend. Uh, D is back in Brooklyn doing the production work for us, and we're very flattered here tonight to have special guest Milt Bearden joining us on the show. He's the author of The Main Enemy, uh, the inside story of the CIA's final showdown with the KGB, co-authored with James Risen, a uh, national security reporter, uh, Milt served as the Soviet East European Division uh, head at the time of the collapse of the USSR and also ran the Afghan task force in the 1980s, uh, the, par the paramilitary program into Afghanistan that was confronting the Soviet Union. Um, Milt's book is incredible. I finished reading it this week. Uh, just a stunning level of detail uh, about a very deadly game of cat and mouse that took place in the late 1970s in 1980s into the early 1990s, really, uh, with the collapse of the Soviet Union. So, Mr. Bearden, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Well, it's great to be with you. <laughs> we really appreciate it. Um, I'm, I'm going to jump right into it with, uh, you know, the classic uh, first question of a Team House interview. What's your origin story? Can you tell us a little bit about your upbringing and, and sort of the path that took you towards governmental service? Yeah, you know, I was born uh, just ahead of uh, World War II starting. And then my dad's generation and all my uncles and everybody went off to that war, uh, except my dad got hijacked into the Manhattan Project. So we moved off uh, from Oklahoma to, to uh, Washington State. And uh, in uh, Hanford, Washington was the Hanford Engineer Works. And that's where he did his part. Uh, of the uh, Manhattan Project. So I was sort of born into uh, that that sense of service. And, and the town that we lived in was Richland, Washington, which was a bedroom community for this whole Manhattan Project up in Washington. And everybody there was one way or another involved uh, with that. And I can remember vividly the uh, the day that the Japanese surrendered finally after the second bomb, which was the one that was produced in Ma in uh, Hanford. Uh, Fat Man, they called it. <clears throat> and uh, the town went, went wild. I mean, everybody was in the streets uh, beating on pots and pans and the war was over. And so that was sort of my sense of, uh, of early public service. Then I did the usual thing uh, after high school, started college, and then said, well, maybe I'll, I'll take that guy up at the recruiting office and go into aviation cadets uh, in the Air Force. And so I went off to Lackland, ready to go into this aviation cadet program, which they had at the time, which uh, uh, was producing a lot of needed pilots. And instead, I got sidetracked there and and they said, well, you're not going into aviation cadets. I said, but that's the deal. They said, well, there is no deal. Uh, and they sent me back to Yale uh, uh, to go learn Chinese. And I thought, God, you know, I, I can't win for nothing on this deal. So we went to Yale. And and after about, a, you know, almost two years of Yale in another place, we uh, had enough Chinese to head off and go out to Korea and ride around on C-47s over the Yellow Sea, listening to Chinese fighter pilots trying to shoot us down. And I think they thought that was really great intelligence. So uh, after that, uh, I went back to the University of Texas and then was teaching, actually teaching Chinese at UT in Austin when uh, a CIA recruiter came up to my office and said, what do you think? Would you like to do something like this? And he kind of laid it out and I said, let's do it. Let's go now, come on. I'll go with you right now, let's go. And so 64, off to Washington, <clears throat> excuse me. And uh, 
I spent a very short time in training uh, because I had languages already. And so they sent me through this, you know, the usual ops training and all that. And then off to Germany in 65, I had German and Chinese and I was there for the East Asia division and then Germany and then from there directly to Hong Kong for some years and then from Hong Kong to Switzerland, German speaking Switzerland for four years, then about a year in Washington back to Hong Kong, uh, then back to Washington for a while and then off starting to uh, take a look at the rest of the world, went off to Africa, Nigeria, then Sudan. And uh, that's about the time that Casey came along and uh, decided that he'd really like me to do something different. And so he um, brought me back and then sent me off to Pakistan. Uh, he had a plan that almost nobody knew the full details of. It included his great friend Maggie Thatcher and the Polish Pope. And Casey was one of those go to mass on Tuesday type Catholics, you know. Uh, so he, he had a, he'd get on his black airplane, the C-141 and fly off to Rome and nobody knew what he was doing over there. Uh, when, when we had that Polish Pope and he and Thatcher and a Polish Pope. And so we did all of that. I went out to, to Af Pakistan, Afghanistan for Casey. Uh, he said, I'll give you a billion dollars. This is part of something big. Uh, we're going after him. We don't want to fight to the last Afghan anymore. What we want to do is to beat him, drive him across the river. You got a billion bucks. You need more. Call me. When and, uh, he promptly went into a, the hospital after that in a coma, and I never talked to him again. Oh my goodness. When you're, uh, I, I would like to backtrack a little bit on that because I thought it was absolutely fascinating uh, in your <laughs> book about how you talk about how Bill Casey had, he had a vision, he had a plan in his mind for the, the end game as far as the Soviet, this confrontation with the Soviet Union was concerned. Um, and I was wondering if you could tell us if you could set the stage a little bit for us where by the time that your book opens, you're getting to be a senior CIA officer in the late, you know, mid to late 1970s. Um, what was the, uh, what were the front lines? What were the main points of contention between CIA and KGB as we roll into the twilight years of the Cold War? Well, it was still a, a, a battle that had sort of been engaged ever since uh, Winston Churchill was in Fulton, Missouri and, and said an iron curtain has descended across uh, Europe and that set in motion something that was just a slugfest. Uh, God, for, for the next 45 years. And it got a little tricky uh, with the Bay of Pigs and the a Berlin crisis. And I think both the KGB and the CIA said, this could get out of hand too quickly. Let's not go after each other directly. Let's, let's kind of watch this stuff like Cuba and Berlin. And so we took the, the battle with them off to that third world playing field in uh, Latin America and Africa, and to a certain extent still across some of Europe. And, and that's the way the game more or less proceeded uh, for the next couple of decades. Uh, later in the game, we very discreetly had opened up a liaison with the KGB uh, to where the chief of SC, my predecessor, Burton Gerber, uh, would take off with whoever was the counterintelligence chief at the time uh, and meet these guys somewhere. And then I picked it up uh, and would do the same thing and go off to Helsinki or Potsdam or God knows where uh, just to sit down with them and say, look, here's what's going on, guys. They were particularly bothered by the fact that in the 80s, uh, when everything was getting very wobbly in the Soviet Union, they were losing KGB officers defecting to our side at a, at a very high rate. We would, at one point, uh, we were getting a KGB uh, officer uh, about every month 
Wow. Yeah. And so, uh, and it usually involved, you know, God, his wife, his kids, a dog, or some other guy's wife, his kids, and a dog, uh, and, and to resettle them. And uh, so they wanted to meet. And we were in Potsdam at that time. One of the senior officers who was the head, one of the head, uh, first chief directorate, Line KR, which is a counterintelligence American guy, said, what's going on? These guys, these are the best and the brightest that we have. They have red diplomas from Moscow State University. They were tops at the Andropov uh, Institute. Uh, what's, what's happening? Why do they, why are they defecting to you? And I said, let me tell you a story. I said, picture this big conference room with a hand rubbed mahogany table, all kinds of people sitting around the table and the CEO of a dog food company sitting there at the head of the table, holding a can of pal dog food or whatever it is. And it's open and he smells it and he says, this even smells good. I would even eat it. So I want somebody to tell me, why can't we sell it? Why are sales constantly like that? What's going on here? It was total silence in the room until a guy kind of at the end of the table raises his hand and the guy says, he says, dogs don't like it. And then the guy says, dogs don't like it? That's the KGB guy turning to me and, and trying to get the picture of this dogs don't like it as an answer to his question of well, why, why are all these guys perfecting? I'm not sure he got it to the day. Okay. I, I never did use that story again to explain. <laughs> they're just not why. buying what you're selling. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they're just not buying it. <laughs> now, when yeah. you said that, especially the early days were, was a slugfest, what does that look like in sort of the spy versus spy world? What does were like CIA officers doing hits on KGB officers, and they were doing hits on CIA? Or did, it does it, how does that look for you in the early days? And that was even before my time. I came in in '85 into the Soviet world uh, when I was deputy chief of the division. But in the early days, well, let's talk about the '60s and, and around there. It was a really provocative type stuff. There was no attempt to let the let 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 things sell themselves. There were some pretty heavy-handed, cold pitches going on on both in both directions, and occasionally, uh, oh, they would think we got out of line a little bit, and 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 even roughed up one of our very senior guys, uh, and and so there there was also some roughing up of uh, KGB officers being arrested by the FBI in the States. And so whatever happened, if the FBI took down a guy and maybe twisted his arm a little bit hard, the next guy we had taken down in, in uh, Leningrad or something like that was going to have his arm torn out of his socket. And uh, so that thing went on for some years. And then finally, Cooler Head says, you know, let's, let's not do this. And, and and when I came in, uh, I inherited a, a, a reasonably well-functioning, very discreet liaison with the KGB, very very secret. In the in my office in the corner of the new building, there was a two-drawer safe, and on it, a black telephone. That phone wouldn't ring unless it was uh, my KGB counterpart calling me and, and wanting to say, hey, we better meet. Let's meet uh, in Tokyo in five days or something like that, or Helsinki or God knows where, to discuss something that he thought would be important. And, and we were able to uh, <clears throat> keep a lid on things. And even that channel, when the diplomatic or government-to-government -government channels were not functioning very well, that channel, was always uh, something that worked. So were there, even though we are, we were, we were sort of these exist, or at least perceived as existential enemies to each other for the intelligence world, was there were still sort of like gentlemen's rules or, or like there, there were rules about how intelligence operations, even against a hostile enemy are conducted. 
Yeah, it became that way. I mean, as I told you, there was pretty provocative stuff early on. Ah. But uh, we both had, you know, 30,000 warheads that would go downrange. And that put us in a different level of, of competition. It's not right. like, uh, East and West Germans taking each other on. It's these are the guys that really have it all. And so <clears throat> we, yes, we had rules. And there was a, a degree of decorum. Uh -huh. And if things got a little flaky somewhere, we would call each other out. And, and not not to wag your finger in somebody's face, but to say, hey, what, what, what are we doing here? Yeah. You know, I, I was wondering if you could talk about the 1985 losses of CIA assets. I thought that was very interesting. And especially uh, <laughs> the conversations you had with one of your colleagues, I believe it was uh, Paul Redman yeah. uh, coming to you and saying, we have a problem. And I, I was wondering if you could talk about what that problem was and how that idea began to percolate and, and, and resolve itself in your minds at that time? Uh, I had been in Africa, uh, first in, in Nigeria, then in Sudan, and, and Casey really liked that. He, 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 he was, you know, following everything I did, and he brought me back. And he brought another officer back from the Middle East, and he was he wanted us to take two jobs. One was the Central American Task Force, which was doing Nicaragua and all of that stuff, mm -hmm. and the Sandinistas. And then the other one was being the deputy chief in SE division. I drew that card and uh, was to go in there and to maybe do some different things. Uh, that was that was Casey's quiet instruction to me. I get into SC division and into my deputy chief's office and the, open the desk drawer and a guy's got one of those rubber things for his finger to go through all the, the cables every morning and it's all smudged with ink. And there are four empty Excedrin bottles in there. And I thought, I got the rubber finger and the empty Excedrin <laughs> bottles. That tells me a lot here. Uh, and maybe uh, part of it was being Burton Gerber's deputy. Uh, although I, got, I, 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 I admire Gerber greatly to this day. But I walked in as the time of troubles was happening. It began with uh, the takedown of Paul Stombau. Uh, uh, and uh, the 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 case he was brought down on was uh, Adolf Tolkachev, which was the billion dollar spy, the guy that paid our budget. Uh, he was in an, a uh, an advanced avionics uh, development uh, department in Moscow, and he gave us everything about what uh, the next generations of Soviet fighter aircraft would be able to do, and we could even build ours around that and it's why for even today uh you know a soviet produced fighter aircraft against an american produced fighter aircraft and i don't care who's flying it uh we're going to win six love six love so uh but the point was all of a sudden he went down and then another went down and another and another and another and all of a sudden you know we look up and we say we've lost all these assets in Moscow, what's going on is only, there's only a couple of possibilities. One, they're reading our mail. Or two, somebody's in here. Uh, most of us believed at that time that spies are almost never caught, either KGB spies or CIA spies on the other side, by the competent organs, as they say. Mm -hmm. by people doing good counterintelligence work almost never happens. It's almost always a betrayal. Somebody drops a dime on somebody. So we looked at it. Uh, I went off to uh, Africa to a station and created a fake operation. And, the, and with the, the, the uh, cable traffic going back to Washington, about allegedly we recruited a, a GRU officer 
Uh, and it went through all the the places we thought it had to go through and nothing happened to the guy. We thought doesn't prove anything 100%, but probably since this guy is still operating, it's probably not our communications. At that moment, the, the cable traffic went through the office where Aldrich James was working, except he had just left to go off to uh, Italian language training for his assignment to Rome. So we learned nothing on that. And then he was gone for a while. And we might have thought the problem was over, but nobody ever let up on that. But you saw from the troubles of 85 until when, uh, 94, when did, when did he get arrested? Uh, right around, yeah. Something right like around there. Right around there in the, in the 90s, uh, uh, the early 90s. So, uh yeah, yeah. And each one of those cases was, you know, a million dollars that we lost. I mean, yeah. We talked to uh, Mr. Olson about this, of course. Uh, sure. And, you know, we uh, you're, we're so we're there's there's the three guys that are well known, Edward Lee Howard, Aldrich Ames and Robert Hansen at FBI, um, who compromised CIA operations and, and assets. Uh, but there's this lingering theory out there that I wanted to ask you, Milt, to this so-called fourth man theory, that there was yet another person sure. in the CIA who was, uh, who was committing acts of treason and has remained undetected to this day. Um, what are your thoughts about that, Milt? I think I might have created that, uh, the, the, the fourth man. When I wrote The Main Enemy, I, I, I put that in there at the end in the epilogue of the fourth man. Uh, yeah. Uh, in the in the counterintelligence in, in looking at our losses, the 85 losses, first when Edward Lee Howard defected, went to Moscow, we said, ha, there it is. Because he had been in the pipeline to go serve in Moscow and he had read into a lot of cases, including uh Tolkachev. And we said, that's it. But then as we lost some more guys that he didn't know, we said, uh oh, what what do we have here? And so then we go off on that until until uh, the you know Ames. Okay, that's an answer. Well, no, it's not, because then there's some things that that we lost that Ames did not know. And then Hansen, yeah, but no, Hansen wasn't wasn't it. So the only conclusion that I can have reached after I. I, I uh, had gone and actually retired and looked at this and wrote I, after I'd written the uh, the main enemy. I said we've still got a fourth man out there, and um, I thought probably a half a generation ahead of me in the agency, so that'd make him a little long in the tooth or even dead by now. Mm -hmm. And I thought maybe we'll never catch him. And we will never find out. But uh, if you still believe, as I do, that the competent organs almost never catch anybody, that it's always a betrayal, then there's a fourth man. And we don't know who he is. Uh, it's probably a he, because it, you know, it's a, it's, if it, I'm not being... Yeah, they're mostly... Feminist, but it's kind of a guy thing to commit treason. I'm, Milt, I'm going to get uh, and ask you about Afghanistan. I do want to give a quick shout out to one of our sponsors for this show. Sure. Uh, the first one is Mad Rabbit, uh, Mad Rabbit Tattoo Aid. I know a lot of our viewers, military members have tattoos, as I do, as Dave does, and they start to fade over time. They start to get damaged. And Mad Rabbit makes this right here. Uh, which helps restore and uh, maintain your tattoos so that they don't fade over time. Uh, they're committed to reinventing tattoo aftercare, founded by two friends with a passion for ink. Mad Rabbit creates simple, effective, and natural products to help improve the healing process and preserve tattoos. So when you think of tattoo care, think of Mad Rabbit. They've preserved over 1.5 million tattoos, and right now they've got an exclusive offer just for the Team House listeners. If you go to madrabbit.com slash team and use the promo code team, 
you'll receive 25% off on your order. That's 25% off when you head to madrabbit.com slash team and use our promo code team. And uh, Dave, do you want to give a quick shout out to uh, SAP Gear? I do. Um, and first off, I just want to say, you know, we do have tattoos and Jack has a Sumerian Navy SEAL tattoo that he wants to protect <laughs> um, very well. Um, so, so Jack and I have been fighting over this piece of gear uh, so far all weekend uh, because we, we only have one between us. Um, but <clears> being <throat> in DEF CON and being that we're in rooms with like Well, we lost him. Yeah, Me? I think we may have. Oh, no, you're back. Oh, sorry about that. So, yeah, so a Faraday bag protects uh, your electronics uh, from any type of, um, from any type of, uh, you know, electrical interference. So if you put your phone in here, it won't ring, you won't get text. But at the same time, nobody will able be able to get into this. It's really good if you're, uh, you know, like if you're an activist, um, if you're a journalist and you don't want to be tracked, like if you're doing things that aren't nefarious, but you know, or if you seen, are, if you're we, a spy, if you're a spy, <laughs> but we've seen with just with the Pegasus spyware and how they, tr you know, track journalists and, and things like that, you know, um, and gotten into their stuff that if you go someplace that you don't necessarily want every app on your phone reporting back or people, you know, war driving or whatever to find you. These are great solutions. So we highly recommend SAP gear. Um, I don't have their, but it's, it's uh, sapgear.com. It's up on the screen. Uh, okay. There's a promo code team and you get a, a, a discount off of your order. Um, yeah. The promo code the promo is code. team and it's 15% off your first order at sapgear.com. So, Milt, uh, the next thing I'd like to ask you about is when Director Casey sent you off to Pakistan um, to take up the Afghanistan account as well from uh, Jack Devine, if I recall correctly. Um, could you tell us a little bit about that? Well, uh, Casey, uh, the DDO had told me Casey had a bug and uh, wanted to uh, send me off to Pakistan. He wanted to alert me to that. And uh, I thought, well, that's okay. So I went to see Bill and usual Casey, it's kind of like a Friday. He's leaning way back in his chair. He's got a stack of books about this high on the corner of his desk up there in the seventh floor. And he's going to take him off to the Long Island over the weekend and probably read them all. Uh, he said, I want you to go to mumble, 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 Pakistan and take over the uh, Afghan thing. And then he kind of got uh, in, in a different mood. Uh, he said, you know, we've been really happy to uh, fight to the last Afghan and sort of tie these guys up, kind of give them their Vietnam, uh, all of that. And he said... The president and I don't think that's moral anymore. And I said, okay. Uh, and he said, I want you to go out there, but th this time you're not just going to go out there and hand out a, the usual money and weapons to, to just fight to the last Afghan. I want you to win this thing. And he said, I'm going to give you in whatever you need. I'll start with a billion dollars. Is that enough? And I said, well, how do I know? A billion dollars sounds like a lot of money. Let me try it. And, uh, and, and I'll get back to you. And so uh, I went, he said, I want you to go tomorrow or take a couple of days more, maybe three days, and then go out to Pakistan, take a look, come back and uh, talk to me about it. Uh, I went out TDY, took a look, and uh, came back and packed out and uh, headed out in the summer of 86. Uh, at that moment, <clears throat> the, the Afghan resistance had been slugging it out with these guys for about five years. Well, uh, more, six, six and a half years. And they came in December, Christmas Eve in 79. And uh, they were sort of hunkered down and, and waiting to be martyred. Uh, the Soviet uh, attack helicopter fleet was just murdering them. And 
finally, we had gotten approval through a, a very obstreperous Washington, D.C., to give them something that might really work against helicopters. And it was the, the U.S. Dinger heavy aircraft missile. And I got out there as we were training our first Stinger team. Uh, and you have to, you almost have to go out to Fort Bliss in, in El Paso and to their big Stinger tra uh, training center, which is like a giant dome with sky and stars and, and, and an environment that is absolutely like a, a stinger gunner would be in, in, a, in a real fight. And it, it's an amazing thing to see. But I get out there and it, we've got a classroom that's about 50 feet long and 25 feet wide. And down at the end, there is a, a white sheet hanging. And it's like your nine-year-old daughter had drawn the world. Here's the earth. And here's a tree, and there's a horse, and here's the sky, and there's a helicopter, maybe. But behind that is a guy with an infrared pointer that is moving it around as an infrared source like an aircraft. And back here in, in, in the room is a guy with a stinger training unit trying to lock on to that infrared source and then it it goes beep 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 and it hits him on the, the the cheek a little bit and then he pulls the trigger and kills it and the whole thing costs about eleven dollars for that stinger training room <clears throat> instead of 26.9 million uh for fort bliss or billion i don't know one way or the other but <clears throat> we sent our first stinger team out in september and they went out by Jalalabad, and we said, hang out about this point here near the end of the runway, and there will be a flight of uh, MI-24 Deltas coming in from Kabul uh, on the afternoon of blah, blah. And sure enough, they came in. This first, the, the commander of that group stood up. He acquired it. He heard the noise, he got the, 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 the cheek uh, bone rattling, and he fired, and it came out of the tube, and the second engine didn't ignite, and it just clattered in the rocks. And instead of an Allahu Akbar, it was like a kind of an oh crap moment, except the other gunner had also acquired an aircraft and had fired just about the moment when they were really upset, and that white tail arced across the sky and popped that first uh, MI-24 Delta and brought it down like a rock. The, the commander had reloaded by that time and he had picked off the second one and the war changed. And it, it wasn't so much that they, they were claiming to have shot down a, a, an aircraft a day. And a lot of it we were being able to confirm from overhead imagery or from uh, SIGINT. But some of them just say, it's fine. If you believe that you're magic now, if you guys are not hunkered down, if, you, if you've if you taken a stinger and a bunch of guys and said, patience, my ass, let's go in and look for some trouble, then it's okay. Mm -hmm. And the war never changed after that. It was always just murder, mayhem. And uh, the Soviets in the next year started talking in Geneva, and then finally, in uh, uh, God, it was February 15, 1989, Boris Gromov, the commander of the Soviet 40th Army, marched across Friendship Bridge about halfway across. He, he got off of his tank and then met his 13-year-old son, Maxim, who gave him a bouquet of carnations. And uh, they walked out of Afghanistan together, and he was the hero of Afghanistan. Uh, that's how he was played back in the Soviet Union. And uh, then you take a look at 89. In February, he marched out. In May, the Hungarians cut the barbed wire on their borders and said, look, 
uh, we're going to let people move a little more freely than they have up to now. In June, the Polish people went out and elected in a free and fair election for the first time, uh, the electrician from Gdansk uh, and, and, and communism was voted out of Poland. Then the most Stalinist of the, uh, the, the, the Eastern countries, East Germany had their Monday demonstrations every Monday, first a couple of hundred and then uh, more and more over the summer and into the fall until in November 9th, 1989, Berlin was full of these people and through a comedy of errors, the Berlin Wall was opened up and they flow, were able to flow from east to west. And basically, and, you know, by you know, a year and plus later, the Warsaw Pact disappeared and came over. Uh, in 1991 on Boxing Day, a little detachment of Soviet soldiers marched out on the Kremlin Wall and hauled down the hammer and sickle for the last time and ran the uh, Russian tricolor up and it was game over. The, the, the entire career uh, that I'd spent, it was over. Okay. Before, oh, uh, go ahead, Jack. Well, before, before we get to the, the end game, I did a couple quick questions about Afghanistan. Um, one of them I wanted to ask you, what was it like working with slash trying to manage a congressman named Charlie Wilson out there? Oh God! Yeah, well, you know, uh, yeah, Charlie was Charlie. Uh, uh, I think Tom Hanks played a good Charlie Wilson. Uh, I, I had I, I was Mike Nichols' uh, advisor on that film, so I tried to keep them all honest. <clears throat> but but uh, Charlie, he had needed something positive to do except womanizing and drinking and all that stuff. And and it it happened uh, to be Afghanistan. It also happened with this lovely lady in Houston, Joanne Herring, that uh, Charlie had some dalliances with. And she was very caught up on Afghanistan. So it became Afghanistan. Uh, then, you know, uh, congressional interest in something a CIA station chief is doing cuts both ways. Mm -hmm. uh, they can either hate you too much like they didn't like the Central American stuff or loved us too much in Pakistan. So I had him out there all the time. And Charlie always wanted to go inside Afghanistan. And, and a couple of times he tried and the, the, the Pakistanis wouldn't let him in. And I talked finally to the head of the Pakistani service. I said, let's just do it right. So we got it all lined up with one of the commanders and got him a white horse. And we even tried, we had stinger gunners all through the hills. We even had uh, some people dragging a dusty road, trying to kick up dust and attract some Soviet air. So, but we never did get that for Charlie, but he, he, he rode around on his white horse in Afghanistan with the Mujahideen and fired off some rounds and, that drove his testosterone levels up to you know, beyond readable. And, uh, it, uh, but, uh, you know, if anybody in Congress was important to, to helping bring down the Soviet Union in Afghanistan, it was Charlie. And uh, even though some others, once it, once it started looking like, uh, like uh, we might be winning that thing, then they all wanted to come over and get a piece of it. But Charlie was the man. And uh, I, uh, I was sort of uh, his dearest friend until he died. There was a, a conversation that you talk about on page 345 of The Main <laughs> Enemy that I thought was very interesting uh, with a, that you had with somebody of the Russian embassy named Bachan Karchenko. Oh, yeah, Bachan Karchenko, yeah. And I, I thought this was an interesting conversation. I mean, in, in the sense, Milt, uh, I mean, you, you're clearly a, uh, an intelligent, dedicated uh, professional. But what came out of that conversation is that you were also playing this game for keeps. You were in it just as hard as the Soviets were, and you were not playing any games. 
Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I mean, they, but see, I was. Uh, they all were wanted to take shots at me one way or the other uh, when I was in Pakistan, and I would go occasionally into Afghanistan, and they really wanted to uh, pick me up there, and that that would have been a great uh, benefit for them. But uh, yeah, yeah, I uh, I think he was saying, well, what if we don't leave? And I just looked him in the eye. I said, look, you know, we're just going to keep killing you until you do. And uh, I said, I don't want to kill your boys. I mean, they're just like everybody else's boys. But yeah, that's what we'll do. And, and you know, I don't know if he knew what to handle. He was carrying that message. Uh, but he was, you know, kind of a KGB thug. And, and they all like to do that. Then they would ever so often send a nicer one in uh, to see if they could get something out of me. Yeah. Well, it sort of sounded like you were saying, like, "Hey, you're you're attacking our soldiers as they're trying to uh, retreat back to the Soviet Union." And yeah, you're like, no, that, you, that, know, that, you were like, "Yeah, yeah, we are." We, we, I, we, I said, "As long as you keep on the right road, and don't turn back." <laughs> I'll try to keep those people, but uh, when you turn turn around and look at us again, here we go. No, that so that moment when they take down those first those first helicopters because. For people who don't know, the helicopters were just devastating. They were like they were unstoppable and they were devastating the Afghan population. What happened to the Russian military, to the to the diplomatic channels and then to the intelligence channels like after that very first attack? Well, uh, you know, before that, of course, uh, the, the, all we had was really uh, 12.7 machine guns, which is uh, 50 caliber uh, and that uh, the, the, the Soviet uh, attack helicopters are so heavily armored, it just pings off. Uh-huh. Unless you happen to be above them and they're flying below you in a valley, then you might get lucky, but you know, almost never, ever happened. So when we brought down those first helicopters at Jalalabad, boom, uh, we were monitoring as best we could uh, through signals intelligence what was going on in Kabul. They sent a team down to look at say what's this? What's this? What happened here? Because uh, they didn't, you know, their intelligence wasn't great. They knew there was a debate because it was very public in Washington about getting the stinger in there, but they didn't know if that was what that was. Mm-hmm. And. Uh, uh, and it, uh, the next thing that was most pronounced is that the Stinger's operational altitude is really going to be about something under 10,000 feet, 3,000 meters plus. And uh, we noticed that the uh, the MI-24 attack helicopter guys were starting their strafing runs at 10,500 feet and and pulling out at 10,700 feet. You know, I mean, they, uh, they just tried to stay above it for a while because, you know, they were good pilots, brave guys, but a helicopter pilot surviving uh, a crash and getting picked up by the Mujahideen, even though I offered uh, every every guy that uh, turned one over to me, I offered them a Toyota Hilux pickup truck, white with red pinstripes, uh, as a as a reward to give me the pilots. Uh, uh, so they stopped uh, amusing themselves with their knives on these guys, but. Uh, it changed everything, changed the tactics, uh, and it changed the mood. And, you know, that's the whole story is, is you know, patience my ass. Let's go and look for some trouble. And then with with Hungary cutting that barbed wire, do, do you feel like it could be just the general demise of the Soviet Union you know, or the beginning of the demise of the Soviet Union? But do you feel as though their retreat from Afghanistan, the defeat in Afghanistan, kind of led Hungary to go like they're not all powerful? Yeah, yeah the, the, the Hungarians, you know, they've been invaded before by the Soviets and, and um, they are very cerebral. And, and I always thought um, more so than some of the other satellites. Uh, and they figured they're not coming back. Mm-hmm. They, they watched that pull out. They were very they were watching this whole story and they thought, that these guys can't turn around and come here. Mm-hmm. And then the Poles were the next to watch it. Mm-hmm. And then finally, even, you know, God, after the East Germans, the most Stalinist 
of the of all of them. And then it became, you know, the Czechs, well, my God, what a the Velvet Revolution there with all that crowd from the Magic Lantern Playhouse, uh, Václav Havel and all his guys. What a what a what a time. But then I was back as the chief of SC at that time. And I was, as soon as that started happening, I was on an airplane or one of my senior guys would be on an airplane to quietly start talking to the Poles and the Hungarians and, and everybody and saying, look guys, this is the moment where we may want to really talk and see about your how, how your life changes after you've been locked up with these guys for the last 45 years. And uh, we did some um, wonderful stuff that we've been trying to do for 40 years uh, in those in that next year or two, getting good things that we always needed on the Soviet side through these other guys. As, as the- you know, Even the Poles, the, the DDO of the Polish service, we had some people that were in real trouble in, in Iraq as that thing, the, the first Gulf War came off, and I said, you know, I need, you got a bunch of people there in a, in a big project, and I wonder if if uh, you might give me some help in getting a few guys out. And he said, and the DDO looked at me, he says, I'll go myself. Wow. You tell me what to do, I'll go get them. And he did, he went there and got them out. Milt, I, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit. I mean, you described how the, the Soviet Union began to go into free fall. Obviously, that, that's a huge topic in of itself. Um, but this also shuffled the mental deck of cards for both CIA and KGB. And you talk in your book about how people who had dedicated their entire lives, decades of their lives to this fight, suddenly are having to adjust and adapt to a rapidly changing world. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that and about how the CIA, from your perspective, you found that the agency was fighting for uh, relevancy with CNN, of all things, now, now that we're in this era of live television news. Well, yeah, I try. Actually, I, <clears throat> I was a big advocate to let CNN do its stuff. You know, I mean, it's in many ways, uh, you know, in, in some ways, it's like the, 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 the closed circuit camera in a 7-Eleven store. Uh, we don't need to compete with those guys. We need to do real things. Mm -hmm. And and uh, because so much is opening wide open here, let's 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 uh, let's reevaluate and say what is it that's a secret? What, what what is it that we have to know? Or what is it that we want to do and not just to try to steal a secret here or there to do something and how are we going to do that? And so, the, you know, with the Berlin Wall down on November 15th, 1989, or November 9th, 1989, when that happened, the world changed. And in rapid succession, all of those, all of the Warsaw Pact fell apart. And then by 1991, it was, it was back to Russia. And I, the, it was a shock to a lot of people uh, that had spent their careers in, in SC division at CIA, when all of a sudden, all the stuff that's in my two drawer safe doesn't matter too much anymore. And we're gonna have to adjust to what this is. And, you know, I, I even got into, you know, uh, opened up, you know, uh, serious liaison with, uh, with the KGB and I did it partly because when you're when when anybody is undergoing rapid change, particularly dislocating type change, they're very vulnerable. And I remember um, Bob Strauss, that old Texas poker player, was the ambassador, our ambassador to Moscow. I went out to Moscow, and, I, and he and I had become fast friends. He's a good Texas buddy, and we, I said, I want to take you over to meet the new chairman of the KGB, this guy, Vadim Bakatin, who came from way outside. And it, I think we can get them kind of maybe rattle a, little, a few cages here. And he was all game for it. And so we're in the big conference room with this Vadim Bakatin and some of his minders. And we're talking about how maybe it's the time for us to start, stop, stop doing some things to each other and start looking for new ways to 
<clears throat> go forward together. And he pointed over and said, you see that safe over there? In there, I have the plans for everything this organization did to uh, your, the embassy you're building here. All of the technical things that we did to you. And we're talking like that. And I'm, I've been taking notes for Strauss. And I, I wrote in big. And I said, ask him for it. And then just laid my, my notepad there. And he, he kind of just glanced at it. And he said, Mr. Chairman, why don't you just give me that stuff? And he said, then we can move into our embassy. We can take care of all that stuff that y'all did. That's past. And he did. And we found, and, and he gives the entire thing. The blueprints. A lot of people believe that, he, that there was still stuff they didn't give us, but but we were able to manage that. I mean, uh, huge technical penetrations of this half billion dollar embassy. I mean, we spent you know a, a couple hundred million building it. They spent a couple hundred million bugging it, and then we spent a couple hundred million pouching pieces back to Washington to look for stuff. And so it's the most expensive embassy in the world, or building in the world. And, and just gave it to us. Uh, Dee, do we have any questions for uh, for Milt? Uh, yeah, we do. We have one from Danny. Is uh, thanks, Danny. Uh, is the F Philip Seymour Hoffman character in the movie Charlie Wilson's War, starring Tom Hanks, partly based on Milt? Uh, no, no. Uh... I'm, I'm sort of, I kept it when I was working on the movie with Mike Nichols, I kept that absolutely minimal to where I, my name, true name was mentioned one time. The main character is a CIA officer, uh, true name Gus Davrakatos, who was a very rambunctious uh, Greek American who, uh, uh, he was with Charlie through thick and thin and, and uh, he was, uh, played by uh, uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman in the movie, uh, that character. And that, that was certainly not me. Any others, Dave? Yeah, we have one from Isaac. How would you compare the Javelin program in Ukraine and the Stinger program in Afghanistan during the Soviet oh. invasion? Yeah, great one. Yeah, you know, <clears throat> uh, it's, I tell you, completely different weapon systems, but the same silver bullet thing. Now, if, if, if it's Soviet or Russian armor that is making life awful for these Ukrainian fighters and you give them something that takes out Russian armor at great distance, it's, it's a silver bullet and it shoots through the resistance. And, you know, that's what you need is, is that kind of a thing that, that gives them a sense of a little more invincibility to where they're not just hunkered down waiting to get killed. And, you know, I don't think that thing is going to go where I thought it was going to go. I thought that the Ukrainian thing, that the Russians wouldn't be so screwed up that, that they'd actually be able to occupy the place. Mm -hmm. And then I thought, uh, then the fun begins. If if we thought we were able to make the Soviet Union's life miserable in Afghanistan after they occupied the place by running covert operations with the Mujahideen against them, what could we have done from Poland or Romania next door with all that great long border and made life miserable for the Russians in Ukraine forever? But uh, Putin's managing to do that without any help from us. Yeah. Uh, uh, what a mess he got himself into. That, I think, is, uh, you know, the final topic I'd like to talk about for this interview, Milt. I know we, we have limited time with you. Sure. Um, but sort of an open-ended conversation or question about, you know, not too many people have the amount of experience you have in running uh, intelligence operations or paramilitary operations against the Russians. Uh, I was wondering, I know you talked about it a little bit, but if you could expand a bit on your perspective about uh, the motivations of Vladimir Putin and how the war has unfolded in Ukraine over the last, you know, what, what are we at five or six months now? A couple of things that are important here is that from the time I joined the CIA in 1964 
until I got to Afghanistan. I had gone along with the dogma that the Soviet Union was this super powerful major problem for us. The red menace. Uh, yeah, but we had all blown up with that. Mm -hmm. When I got to Afghanistan and, 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 and up close and, and, and watching how they managed to fight that war, and I started sending back, as they say, sending back dispatches and saying that there's something wrong here, people. Uh, these guys are in many ways, either they, they kept their best out of here or they're, they're, they've got a third world army. And I, I got kind of beat up because uh, our whole, <laughs> we had a whole major part of CIA that had been telling everybody, uh, and us included, uh, for the last, since 1947, the Soviet Union was a major military power. And in fact, um, th there was nothing quite about what they were up to, their equipment, their medical kits, nothing, nothing looked right. And now uh, I carried that over into my, my observation of what's going on in Ukraine. And it's the same. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's the same. It's not the gang that couldn't shoot straight. I don't want to get flippant. But these guys are having their asses handed to them. And yeah, we're, we're, we're passing a lot of fine stuff to the Ukrainians. But, you know, I, I don't think Putin read Clausewitz to where, uh, you know, Clausewitz said if a, if a people puts up a spirited struggle for its own, its own liberty, they're invincible. And I don't think he understood this. I mean, he went in there and look at this. What, what, I don't know if anybody knows, but it, it, have they taken about 20,000 casualties now, TIA? Yeah, estimated around it's, there. It's, it's in there somewhere. Uh, the, the army is a mess. Uh, I saw, you know, we would get, the, the Afghans would capture uh, Soviet soldiers every so often, and I'd pay them off and give them a, 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 a Hilux pickup truck, and they give these guys to me. But they were a mess. I mean, I mean, we, we're not talking about you know stand up kids, and I've had a couple of kids in the in the military and an American military kids, pretty stand up people, and these guys were a mess. And I, I think that's what we're seeing in Ukraine too, and. Uh, and if you uh, people are able to see the numbers now, as they never saw them in, in the financial numbers in Russia, as they never saw them before, and uh, you know, he's not going to pull out of this anytime soon. I mean, uh, you know, the, the GDP is, I think, it's a four uh, percent drop, and it's going to do more next year. And I mean, that's huge. And, and, and all he's got is gas and oil sales, and that's getting very troublesome for him. So uh, I think Vladimir Vladimirovich has really got himself into a pickle. When uh, I, I interviewed uh, your colleague, Jack Devine, years ago, and he talked about how back in the old day, back in, in your day, back in your times, that they, they operated along Moscow rules. But at this time, when I spoke to Mr. Devine, that must have been five years ago, he said that they're not Russia now plays as if there are no rules at all. Um, yeah. do, do you see our proxy war uh, against the Russians in Ukraine as an attempt to, I don't want to say reset, but reestablish some sense of rules? You know, I don't know. Uh, that's a, that's a very good thought, but I think it's, uh, I think that, that the problem is Putin and his vision of Russian empire. It's not that he wants to go back and get the new, so get the Soviet Union cranked up again. I think he wants Russia mm. as, as the Russian empire mm. with the pieces that belong to us. I mean, you, you can take a look at, at the history of, of Ukraine. I mean, that's the beginning of Russia a thousand years ago, Kiev Rus. Uh, 
that's the history. The reality is for 30 years, it's been an independent country. But but he's he's living on the, the, the history idea. The how can it not be part of this? Well, he's finding out. <laughs> and it's not going to work for him. But he can't continue to pay the bills. And particularly, we're not only you know, quietly organizing NATO uh, and, and the Europeans, but, you know, helping them find alternate sources of, of uh, gas and oil. And that'll, in another year or so, that's going to get very tricky for Vladimir. Who else buys anything? Do people buy Tupolovs or Suhois? Nobody buys anything except gas and oil. And vodka, I guess, and, and caviar. Mel, out of curiosity, you know, you, you... You started out with a focus with Chinese and a focus in that area, and then you know went into the, the Cold War with the Soviets and worked actively against the KGB. How do you see modern Chinese espionage in the United States and, and our espionage battle compared to what it was against like the KGB during the Soviet era? Well, you know, it's the Chinese uh they have such a different approach to to intelligence and to the game of agentry uh, or uh, they they have to begin with a massive population of Chinese Americans or or at any given time about thirty thousand Chinese students hoovering up everything that they can get their hands on. Uh, and, and perhaps the easiest place to run intelligence operations in the universe is America. So they, you know, it depends on what they want. Do they want to try to recruit some blonde haired, blue eyed guy from Kansas in the CIA? No, not so much like the Russians might. They, they probably figure out everything they need from us how uh, they can get through a population that may not even understand what's happening, mm -hmm. how they're helping out. And, I mean, you know, everybody, you know, you go up to Mr. Wong in Kansas City and say, oh, God, you know, I'm, I'm a Chinese uh, intelligence officer. I said, yeah, Mr. Wong, goodness gracious, how wonderful. You won't believe this. I met your auntie in, in uh, uh, uh Hussein County in, in, in Guangzhou province. And she even she even remembers that, that that your family is here. How about that? And all of these kind of things can go on. Whereas, you know, the the, the KGB had its operations kind of like ours. But this is something that uh, they they can they can manage to collect without there's a lot of espionage going on, but there's a lot of other stuff that doesn't even qualify for espionage. And they get a, they get a, almost everything they need. Basically, if a Chinese American or a, a Chinese immigrant ha has I think yep, we may have lost Dave there yep. for a moment. Yeah. Uh, hopefully we'll have Dave back in just a second. Um, Milt, you had talked to me. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about what you're working on today? Um, you had mentioned to me that there might be a novel in the works. Yeah, I'm working on, <clears throat> on another novel. I won't tell you much about it, but I started. Uh, uh, my first book was a, was a fun novel, The Black Tulip on Afghanistan. And uh, then I got into this um, uh, big uh, nonfiction with my dear friend Jim Risen in the New York Times. We just decided to do that back in 2003 and did it. And it's luckily it's one of those things that ends up on political science courses and universities all across America. And so it just keeps <laughs> the gift that keeps on giving. Uh, but uh, I want to do another novel uh, that is something new, uh, probably has a biological side to it, and uh, don't want to get into too much more than that. But uh, 
novel writing is is kind of fun because you get to make stuff up. Nonfiction, you're not supposed to make it up. <laughs> I think a lot of guys don't uh, pay attention to that rule, but uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm doing that. And I've, I always got something going on. A non-resident uh, scholar on the, the the national interest, and I every so often write for uh, foreign affairs and stuff like that. It's not enough, you know. Uh, yeah, still got time to garden, plant the cabbage, and stuff. Dave, did you want to finish your thought because you you broke up there at the at the end? No, it was fine. I I, I was just kind of clarify, you know, just saying that basically. Um, that the Chinese are able, if they, if a person ha has family back in China, that the Chinese government leverage is not that. afraid to leverage that. Oh no, not at all. And they leverage it in not a not a very aggressive way. Um, you know, the, uh, what else? Do you, I mean, you can say, "Oh, I talked to your auntie." Oh, well, right. that's, oh that's all I need to hear. Right. Like what? Oh God. And yeah, I mean, it, it, this is. For them, and I think it's it's there's not a lot of big counterintelligence type operations going. This is mostly S and T collection that they want, mm -hmm. and other economic intelligence and stuff like that. And so they're going to get that. This is a great target uh, country for that stuff. So. Everyone out there, I hope that you will go and check out The Main Enemy by our guest. Good fun, a good fun book, yeah. This, was, that Milt, this is honestly, if anyone asks me for one book on espionage or on the CIA to read, this is probably the one I'm going to send them to now. This was, it was really a stunning, shocking book oh, to God. actually read it. And, um, and I don't think there are many authors that have really framed the global context of the Cold War quite the way that you did in, in this sort of back channels and double and triple agents and paramilitary campaigns and how all of that collided and worked with one another, how those systems and institutions interacted with one another. I mean, it, it's really, it, it is an amazing book and I hope people will go and pick it up. Well, thank you. It was a great battle between the shirts and the skins. And then that Saturday morning, the, the skins didn't show up. <laughs> So next, next Friday, we're going to have William Walter on the show. He is a former, uh, he's a gunship guy, AC-130 guy. Yeah. And he, wrote, he wrote a book about it. Um, so we're going to have him on next Friday to speak to him. Uh, Milt, again, thank you so much for joining us and taking some time out of your Friday evening with us. And um, I hope we can talk again sometime soon. We, we just kind of scratched the surface of Milt's Very career. happy to, guys. It's book. just terrific being with you. Take care now. All the best. Thank you, Milt. And yeah. And thank you, everyone watching. We'll see you guys next week.